today we traveled into the harder place to read to show you something amazing. Our adventure began by boarding a four-wheel drive jeep, and we traveled up the mountain deep into the rainforest and jungle of Peru. We went as far as we could, and then we had to get out and hike the rest of the way. We arrived at the most remote and most beautiful tiny house in Peru. I can't wait to introduce you to this guy, who's no stranger building tiny houses, and this time. He began by building this tiny house on the river and has been living here off grid for 14 years. Hey, John, it's so good to be here again. Nice to have you here. You know, I absolutely love your tiny house. Thank you. And you've created this one so different. I mean, you've created this with an open air concept, didn't you? Open air because it's in the jungle and. Uh... What better than take advantage of the wildlife and the atmosphere here uh, and not to be enclosed? You can actually sit out here, enjoy all of the wildlife, the monkeys when they come by, and just really enjoy all this tranquility. Yeah. John, I can't wait for you to show me your cabin again. Come on in. This, as you can see, it's an open area, so it's a pleasant place to sit and uh, read and... Uh, be a part of the nature outside. You can hear the river and see the river and, uh, and watch everything that's going on. It's really just a great indoor place. And inside the doors is your kitchen and bedroom. That's correct, yes. This is a small area shut off from the outside, so if ever I'm not here I can close the doors, but most of the time the doors are just left open. A uh, small area for cooking, because I'm no great cook. Uh, but it's quite sufficient for my needs. I see that uh, you got your fresh fruit. And what's this interesting thing here? This here? Yes. It's a coffee stock. The, what do you make your coffee in? Well, obviously, uh, you don't have a, a coffee pot, and so instead of uh, boiling your water in a teapot, what do you do? Well, you just boil your water on the stove, put your coffee in the coffee stock, and pour the water over the... Coffee. Yeah, the most natural way of doing it. And it's Costa Rica coffee. We actually grow coffee here uh, on this property. Quite often, actually, at night I can sit here and read by candlelight uh, and have a small bunk bed. And that's uh, basically all that uh, anyone needs. John, this place is absolutely beautiful. Matter of fact, you know, when I think about a cabin or a tiny house in the woods, this is exactly what I imagine in my head. Now, John, you came out here when to start building this particular tiny house? It was Christmas 2006. For a couple of weeks to sort of uh, check the place out and see uh, what it offered and uh, whether I was happy to do something here. It was way back in the jungle. I mean, this is kind of unexplored jungle. So, so I... how did you even hear about this place? I heard about it uh, back in England, um, in an old house that I had there, and for some reason I just happened upon this property with lots of waterfall, a uh, thousand acres of virgin forest, and it kind of just took my fancy at a time when I was looking for another project. Well, I can imagine because this place is beautiful. And with lots of waterfalls, I can't imagine anyone not coming back here. Close to 100 water. Close to 100. Close to 100. Now, you, you said that the taxi driver brought you back here with some flies and dropped you off. I required a guide to get me back here, a local guide, uh, to show me where the place was. Because everywhere around here is virgin forest, so it's difficult to know exactly where, uh, where the property was. So I had a local guide, someone that was born and bred here. Uh, he, I, taxi trucks usually bring people and supplies into some of the remote regions here. So he brought me back as far as he could uh, on what was then just a muddy jungle track. It could take three hours to, wow. get, to get the 15 miles from the nearby town to a little pueblo of about 10 or 12 scattered farmhouses here. So the first part of the... the uh, to get back to the nearby Pueblo. And then a local guide with a horse 
uh, brought me and my supplies back here, dropped me off and uh, was told to come back and pick me up two weeks later. So I spent Christmas and New Year's here on my own. So Christmas and New Year's, you practically camped on a piece of property that you'd never seen just to decide if you wanted to buy this place. That's right. So what, did you stay in a tent? Uh, there was an old shack uh, that, that went back to the days when it was homesteaded about 40 years ago. Uh, the old farmstead was overgrown, but the shack was still... I mean, shack is too grand a term for it. It was an absolute ruin. Uh, it had a tin roof, but it was easier than camping out. So I just kind of uh, set myself up in that uh, little shack there. We, we later called Casa Alacran because it was infested with scorpions. Um, and that's where I stayed for two weeks. Wow, so you stayed in a scorpion-infested shack for two weeks. Yes. While you did what for two weeks? I explored the area. So um, you had an opportunity to just kind of walk around, explore, but it wasn't as simple as walking around, was it? No, there were no trails here, or what few short trails there were didn't go anywhere, so basically for the two weeks I had a bushwhack. In other words, just come away through in a teddy. Uh, on a it's kind of a rough map that I had because the Costa Rica topographical maps go back 50 years, so it's hopefully out of date. You can just make out a little bit from them. So you basically it's just following river courses uh, and see where you are just to get the lie of the land. But you had the bushwhack. So you stayed here for two weeks, whether it was the waterfalls, you fell in love with the property. What was it that you liked the most about this place? The climate for one thing. Uh, spring-like, I mean, we're only nine degrees off the, the uh, equator here, so you'd expect it to be very hot. And I'm not, it's getting old now, uh, heat kind of bothers me. Never did when I was young, but it bothers me now. So it was spring-like, uh, cold at night in actual fact. And uh, what, what I consider to be a, a worthwhile kind of climate. So that was one thing. The other thing was the magical mist, because at that particular time the mist was just swirling around the mountains and creating uh, all kinds of patterns and that. Almost like uh, a ghost, a uh, silvery ghost escaping from the, uh, from the mist. And so I would spend, strangely, several hours a day just watching the mist drift around and, and remembering old days and old times. It was just, just a nice, it just had a nice feeling about it, that's right. basically what it was. I, I didn't know whether I was going to stay here um, or do anything here to start with. Uh, I had thought actually, because um, I was in Scotland before I came here, I had thought of going down to Chile. One reason or another I decided to, to do something with it. So you decided to stay here. Now you mentioned that you're getting older. How old are you, John? Well, now I'm 76. 76. Well, 76 next month, so to be correct, I'm 75, but I was 62 when I came here. So I was a young man when I came. Uh, so there was no problem doing anything at that age. So you were here during Christmas and New Year's and you fell in love with the place, you decided to buy it. At what point did you decide to start building? Did you immediately start building? Yes, pretty much, because I had to have something to do. I'm a, I'm a workaholic, I have to be busy all day, so uh, two weeks wandering around was fine, but that was it. Uh, certainly there were, there were things I wanted to see at a later date further afield. Um, this is a big problem. It takes six hours to get from one side to another wow. pretty well. So it was, a, it was limited to what I could do. But I put that on hold uh, and I built little houses. I built cabins. I've been building all my life ever since I was a young man. So I, what, what else do I do? Is my natural thing to build and so I selected a spot here by the river, uh, and that's where we are now. And started building. Yeah. And this particular project, this tiny house is now, how old is this tiny house? 14 years. 14 years. And you built this whole thing out of treated lumber, didn't you? Treated wood from uh, Chile and Argentina. Wow. Southern pine, as they call it. Southern pine. Southern pine. Wow. And about 10 tons of it had to be carried in. 10 tons of lumber. Packed and a generator and every other thing. Every other thing. I, I had the luxury of a small generator. Uh, so I could use small power drill tools, electric drill, uh, cross cut saw. Um, to, get a, to, look, to do a better job. You can't, right. I mean, originally I, I was taught woodwork and everything was done by hand. Nobody had an electric drill or any luxury. So everything had to be done by hand. Uh, so I was brought up that way, 
Um, but now I, I tend to like to use small powers uh, to get a better job done. You've told me before when we've talked, you're no stranger of building cabins or tiny houses. Matter of fact, you've been building tiny houses since long, long before tiny houses became a popular thing. Oh, 50 years ago. Now, how many tiny houses or cabins have you actually built? Well, I've lost count, but I would say probably nine or ten. So, what were some of the places you built? Uh, Scotland. I built two or three in Scotland. Uh, the Adirondack Park in New York. We had a beautiful cabin there. I loved it. Uh, Canada, Nova Scotia, several in British Columbia. But always in mountain scenery, apart from that, sure, of course. But uh, in the Adirondack Mountains, I was riding the mountains there. Uh, in uh, British Columbia, the last place I had there was at the top of a mountain. The nearest neighbor was 42 miles, I think. Wow. So it was hard to get to. Harder than this place to get to. <laughs> so you built a lot of tiny houses and cabins, but then you decide, okay, you're going to build this tiny cabin by the river, and you started, what, just a couple of months after you bought the property? February 2007. Because after I'd been here for two weeks, I had to go back and uh, start putting everything I, I needed together. It was very difficult at that time. It's a little easier now. It's very difficult to, to get material for schools and anything of any quality in Costa Rica. The, the selection is, well, there wasn't a selection, put it that way. So I had to spend a month or so getting everything together, generator, school, uh the wood, getting all the wood that I needed, because there's a lot of wood here. Now, that must have been a huge task, because I know we came up here, and it's not like you could just drive in here. Today, it's probably a little easier than it was then. A lot easier. But even if you could drive to the end, it's still about a, a half a mile's hike to this place. There's no road next to this tiny cabin. The old Indian trail that goes back several hundred years. So the wood, uh, from, from Buenos Aires, uh, it was a jungle track, uh, the longest trip here for the 15 miles, nine hours. So that will give you an idea, chaining up, out with shovels, uh, lots of tackles to try and get the trucks in as far as we could. And we managed to get them in to within about half a mile. Uh, at a later date, we couldn't even do that, so everything had to be brought in by pack horse and ox, ox car. Uh, so about half a mile, and then everything just had to be put on, put on the shoulder, literally everything. So y'all had to in. literally hike everything in about a half a mile yeah. so that you could actually build right here next That's to the right. river. Yeah. Wow, that is amazing. Yeah. That's it. How long did it take you to actually build this tiny house? Not including the time that it took to get materials in, the actual construction was about three months. About three months. Yeah. Working every day. And so while you was working every day for three months, where did you live? I lived in the uh, Casa La Cran. You lived in that, I, I lived that scorpion infested shack? For three months, yeah. Wow. <laughs> but I, I didn't get stung there. Not one. Really? But I was spotting them. You know, I had a, a seat. I had a, a little table there. Uh, candlelight, because no electricity or anything here. My machete was stuck in the floor, so any scorpion that made the mistake of coming in with my point of vision, I could... You I could get it. I get it. So I wasn't stung there at all, which is amazing, but many times since. Right. Now, that's what's interesting, because, like you said, you still don't have electricity here at this tiny house. No. And so you've had to literally, when you lived out here, you lived here on nothing but candlelight. And what better? Right. You don't need electricity. I still don't need electricity. Most of my life has been without electricity, and I prefer it that way. To be quite now, that's interesting because we are very, very remote. So not only did you not have electricity, obviously you had plenty of water, which makes me wonder, you know, this water that's coming out of the mountains, you didn't have any fear of it being... Dirty or not clean? No, none of no, so, it. It comes straight off the mountain. There's no farms up there. There's no cows, no animals. It's a natural, about as natural a, a river or stream as you can get. So it's so, about as clean as it could possibly be. Yeah, clean, and I would say the most city water supplies. I can imagine. So I just uh, put my bucket or whatever. Uh, I time into the river and got my water. My water. So you would do a lot of your cooking, although we saw the kitchen a little while ago, and so you'd cook in the kitchen, 
and you'd also cook your by campfire a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Now, people are wondering because you know there is no shower here. Where did you bathe, John? Uh, I just back in the in the in the woods. So you just bring your water from the creek and bathe in the woods? Well, you just use the old-fashioned way with a can and a garden sprinkler at the bottom and hang it up in a tree and stand underneath it. Okay. And, you know, what could be better? Uh, you're, you're a woodsman, and you love being in the woods. You spent, you spent many months in the woods alone. I, I know you've told me you've never even uh, been on Facebook, no. but a lot of times we see these uh, uh, amusing posts on Facebook where they'll post this idyllic cabin somewhere on a mountaintop, and they'll say, could you survive here a month uh, without Facebook, a month without Internet, a month without phone? Could you survive there and get paid a hundred thousand dollars? Nobody's actually paid you, and you've done it for years, haven't you? What better way to live? All right, without all of the noise, without all the noise, the congestion, the criminality of a city. Wow. I mean, how can you say that spending half your life in a traffic van trying to get to and from work is civilization? Right. Civilization is here. Not in a city. I can only imagine living right here next to the river. I can imagine how peaceful that can be. But right now, John, you have been living in Costa Rica for how long? 14 years. 14 years off grid. Yeah. Now, you don't live here in this particular tiny cabin anymore, do you? No, uh, I lived here for uh, about six months. months. So immediately when you got done building this one, you told me you got bored. So you started building another tiny, what I call a tiny cottage where you live at now. Yeah, well, you have to have something to do. So. Well, you know, when you're way out here, and I guess if you don't have Facebook, you don't have telephone and Internet, you got to have something to do, don't you? Keep yourself, well, keep your mind occupied more than anything, yeah. So how long did it take you to build your house now, the tiny cottage? Uh, that was probably hard to say now because it's so long ago, but four or five months. And, and so, I, moved, I moved into it before it was finished anyway because it was easier. Right. Uh, to be there. To be there where you're actually working, yeah. And so you lived here for probably about six months while you were building that. You moved into it. And that's a story for another time. So I can't wait to actually see. But you kept yourself quite busy with a number of projects that you've built here on your thousand acres. Lots of things. A lot of things. Well, as you can imagine, over 14 years. And at the rate that you build things, uh, I can imagine it doesn't take you long to get done with a project before you get bored and you start building yet another project. Right. How big is this tiny house? Uh, 14 by 22 and a half, so just over 300 square feet. So just over 300 square feet, and it really has everything that you need. Yeah, and more. Now, the only thing that is missing is that there really isn't a toilet right here connected to this cabin, is there? No, there's an outhouse, the, the, the original outhouse that the old pioneers used years ago that worked without any problems, without all modern plumbing to go wrong and everything else. It's just basic and what more do you need? Yeah, an outhouse. So you've got a, a, a little outhouse. It's a little away from the rivers, obviously, oh, yeah, to keep everything uh, yeah. clean and sanitary. Yeah. And uh, so anytime that you need a bathroom, you've got the outhouse, you've got the river. You really have everything that you need to just enjoy a peaceful and tranquil life in the rainforest and jungles of Costa Rica. Is there anything that you miss being out here? Silly little thing, like fish and chips or a curry or something like that, or being able to go down to a pub or something like that. So I've got my own pub here now, pub and eatery, which I built after my house. But it's not the quite place. the same as walking no. into a pub and no, talking no. to some of the locals. Well, I still talk to some of the locals now because a lot of them are coming back uh, because it's becoming something of an attraction. And see, well, obviously, there's a lot of people that wants to know why someone as old as you from England has come all the way to Costa Rica to live in this remote area. Yeah, most of them don't understand. I think I'm some kind of a quirk or someone that's uh, 
had problems with life and just wanted to bury himself miles away from civilization. But that's not the story, it's just it's a beautiful place to live and who would want to live in a city when they have the choice of living here? Absolutely. Now, you know, you don't have electricity out here, but you know, I can imagine someone who enjoys the pub, how do you cool your beer? You put it in the river. So you <laughs> use the river for your refrigeration? Yes, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a mountain stream, it comes off. Uh, the, the mountains here go up to just over 10,000 feet, so the water that comes springs off the mountains is cold. It is very, very cool, cold. Yeah. And that's yeah. the reason you don't bathe in the river. No, it's too cold for me. It's too so cold. Give me a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this place is quite phenomenal, and I can't wait to actually share with everyone some of the other projects that you've built here. You know, this really is a, a magnificent place. And although you don't live here anymore, this place is for rent, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes. So there are uh, people from time to time, if any time they want, they can come out here. And if they want to just kind of get away from the noise, they can actually rent this place for a night, a week, a month, for however long they want. This place is available that they can rent. And they can, they can contact me, and I can put you in touch with Sean, who can facilitate your arrival here at this place. So long as they can do without social media for the length of time that they're here. That might be a challenge There's for some no people. telephone signal either. There's nothing. No telephone, no, no telephone, no internet, no Facebook, but they do have the peace and quiet of Mother Nature. And the wildlife is prolific here, wonderful monkeys. Tell me about the wildlife. We have everything that you would sort of expect in a, in a tropical forest. We have two types of monkeys. Uh, we have the spider monkey. Uh, and the capuchin monkey. Spider monkey is protected species. We have two groups of them here. One of only, I'm told, and I, I can't confirm this, maybe one of ten or so groups in the whole of Costa Rica. So this is a, is something of a protected environment. And that's one of the reasons you asked me, um, in the beginning, why I, 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 I chose to, uh, buy this place and stay here. And I said it was a climate and the magical mist. Another one was it, it was a place that needed protection. So I, I uh, decided right away that uh, the only way to protect some, something is to actually be there right. physically. So the wildlife was, was a big uh, attraction to the monkeys. We have the uh, tape, yeah. photographs of the tape taken right outside here at night. Really? They weigh about 500, 550 pounds. It's a big animal. Uh, and then we have a problem. I had a bit of a problem here with a porcupine coming in and chewing the wood. Really? Yeah. Porcupine? Porcup yeah. We have the Mexican hairy porcupine, actually. Uh, uh, well, uh, avian life, of course. We have lots huge, of birds. Oh, lots of birds. You know, from the tiniest little hummingbird to the huge turkey like haver. Uh, we have every kind of bird. Butterflies, like the leaves, the colors of the butterflies. This is something. Matter of fact, you have some butterflies out here that I saw that actually have transparent wings, don't they? Oh yeah, you see right through the wings. See through the wings, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, like a piece of glass. Wow. Now, uh, what about dangerous things like mountain lions or jaguars? Do you have any of that? Do you have a problem with that here? No, I mean... So you do have jaguars here, yeah. but it's not a threat. Well, not to me, but they... Jaguars killed two of my horses. Oh, I really? Lost, I lost two horses to Jaguar and I want a snake bite. They have snakes here, as you'd expect in the jungle. No, no, again, not a big problem if you're careful. It's right. the same old story. If you take proper precautions, then you're okay. So if we have snakes here, uh, the uh, wildcats, we have all five wildcats here. Not a problem at all. No, no, no. There's just nothing whatsoever to be scared of here. Something Put your hand down there, John. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do they bite? Yes. Try to carefully, what? carefully put it down. Come, come to me with it a little bit. Wow. What is he? Six inches? Yeah. Uh, and also, in the 14 years I've been here, I've never, ever closed the door. My door right now in my house has been wide open, day and night, 24 hours. Uh, I would be more scared in the city, because in a city, everything is a threat to you. Security alarms and everything like that. What do you need here? Well, John, I have to admit, I'm a little bit envious of your place here. 
because for me, you know, as a kid, I've always loved the woods. And John, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to show me your welcome. tiny house by the river. Always nice to have a visitor. John, I look forward to seeing more and sharing with the other people some of the other places that are here. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. You're welcome. John has done something here I think a lot of us could do if we would be willing to give up some of life's conveniences and enjoy a simpler way of living. For me, I've often wished I could live the life John is living, and maybe someday I will. John's story has inspired me, and I hope it has inspired you to realize life is all about the choices we make. It seems John has found his piece of paradise by building a tiny house in Costa Rica. I think building a tiny house could be the answer to living an affordable and simple life in Costa Rica.